In this tutorial, I will show you how to calculate the live load moment due to truck loading on a single span bridge, which is simply supported. And this procedure just uses hand calculations, which of course could be then put on a spreadsheet to easily work out the live load demand. So just reviewing the truck that I have over here, I'm going to use a Canadian truck, also known as CL625, which has a total load P of 625 kilonewtons. It's got five axles, P1 to P5, and the load per axle has been provided in this table. And the axles are spaced at distances denoted by R, R1 to R5, R1 being the distance of the first axle from itself, because that's a starting point, so thereby R1 is zero. And then R2 is the distance of the second axle from P1, and that is 3.6 meters and so on. And so at the top, if you want to refer to the notations, so PI stands for axle load. And as I had mentioned, I goes from one to five. And then the spacing is RI, and that also goes from one to five. So the first thing we want to do is determine the center of gravity of the truck. If you see in black over here, I've said that the CG, let's say, sits at a distance of X from the first axle P1. And so I need to locate the distance of the CG from the start of the truck. I have distances of each axle from the starting point. So I've got X2 through X5, which are a function of the axle spacings, but that gives you the location of each axle relative to the first axle, okay? So in order to find the CG of the truck, I will take the moment of the entire load of the truck, which is sitting at the CG right now, P, about P1. So that would be the total load P times the distance to P1x. And this should be equal to the sum of the individual moments of axle loads about P1. So this would be equal to P1 times X1 plus P2 times X2 and so on till your last axle P5 times X5. There is a mathematical way of denoting this. We can say that P times X is equal to summation of when I varies from one to five, PI times XI. And then solving for X, this means, I'll just say summation PI times XI divided by P being the total load of the vehicle. So this would give me the distance of the CG of the truck from the first axle. And just to reiterate, XI in this expression is the summation of RI as I varies from one to five. So X1 would be equal to R1, which in our case is equal to zero. X2 would be equal to R1 plus R2, in our case, 3.6 and so on until x5, which would be r1 plus r2 all the way to r5, which would be the distance between the first axle and the last axle. So when we do the math, what we find is for a CL625 truck, this distance x works out to be 9.2 meters. So the next thing we want to do after we worked out the CG of the truck is to position the truck on our simple span. So our single span is shown over here. And in order to do that, what we've got to do is position it such that the CG and the nearest axle, in our case, it's axle P4, are equidistant from the mid span. So the center of the span would be at L over two if the total length of the span is L. And so what we want to do is have the CG and the nearest axle sitting at an equal distance from it. So I've got this parameter A. So P4 from mid span should be at a distance of A by two. And similarly, the CG from the mid span should also be at a distance of A divided by two, if the total length from the CG to P4 is A. Okay, so that's the next thing we wanna do is we wanna position truck for maximizing moment. So let's calculate the parameter A. A would be equal to the distance of 
axle P4 from axle P1, so that would be X4 minus X, which is the distance of the CG from the first axle. This, if we wanted to elaborate, we know that X4 is equal to R1, which is 0, plus R2 plus R3 plus R4. So this would be equal to R2 plus R3 plus R4 minus X and for CL625. And then doing the math, we get A is equal to 2.2 meters. Then the next step for us would be to determine the support reaction at B. You can use any of these points to determine the support reaction. We just decided to work our way from point B because the calculation is a bit simpler. Ignore the whole truck, just focus on the CG. And this is where the entire load of the truck is sitting P. So this is nothing but a load, a point load sitting on a simple span of length L. And the distance of this load P from the start of the bridge is equal to L over two which is half the span length minus this distance A over two. Then the load that it transmits to point B would be equal to RB is equal to the total load P times L by two minus A by two, this whole thing divided by the total span length L. Let's say if we were dealing with the span L equal to 70 meters, then we would get RB is equal to 303 kilonewtons. So L is a variable in this case. Whatever span length you're dealing with, you could then work out the support reaction at B for that particular span length. So the next step is to determine the maximum moment which occurs at the axle that's nearest to the CG, which in our case happens to be axle P4. So as you can see in this moment diagram over here, of course, the moment diagram is quartered and it turns, it changes slope um, at every axle location and the maximum moment occurs at the location of P4. So that moment would be equal to, there's a counterclockwise moment produced by the reaction RB. So RB times the distance of RB to P4 and that distance would be L over 2, which is going to the mid span, minus A over 2. Now there is the axle P5 that is going to impart a clockwise moment. So we need to subtract that from this. So minus P5 and P5 about P4, the lever arm is R5, so times R5. So then for a span length of, let's say, L equal to 70 meters, the unfactored M max produced by a single truck and that truck being CL625 would be equal to 9268 kilonewton meters. So now just to summarize everything. First, you find the CG of the truck. Then you position the truck to maximize the moment. And the way you do that is by keeping your CG and the nearest axle equidistant from the mid span of your bridge. And for that, you need to calculate the parameter A, which is the distance between the CG and the nearest axle. And then after that, you would determine the support reaction, whichever support you want to work from. In our case, we've decided to work from support B using this formula. And then you would determine the maximum moment that occurs at the location of the axle nearest to the CG, in our case, P4. And the formula for that is given right here. So with this procedure, you should be able to find for your truck and for any span length of a single span, the maximum moment due to the design truck. In this tutorial, we'll determine the live load moment on a single span bridge due to lane loading through hand calculations. For this, you'll need to refer to the previous tutorial where we calculated the maximum moment due to a truck on a single span. In this example, the truck that I'm using is a CL625 truck that can be seen in this diagram over here with axles P1 through P5 at a spacing of R2 through R5. Now for lane loading, in addition to truck, you also have a uniformly distributed load, which the Canadian code prescribes as nine kilonewtons per meter. Let's call that W for a general case. And according to the Canadian code for lane loading, you add 80% of your truck load demands to 
the demands produced by this UDL of 9 kilonewtons per meter for lane loading. I'm assuming other codes around the world have something similar, which has a truck component and a uniformly distributed load component. The bending moment diagram due to the UDL is shown on the bottom and the superimposing of these two effects with the truck reduced to 80% as per the Canadian code would give you the lane loading. So let's calculate the bending moment due to lane loading. So for that, we'll need to first determine the reaction RB due to this UDL. And that RB would be equal to the UDL times the total length of the bridge divided by two. So we would calculate the moment at the location of the maximum moment that's produced by the truck, M live load truck, TR. So the moment due to the UDL would be equal to RB times L by two minus A by two, which is simply the distance of RB to the point of interest minus the clockwise moment produced by the UDL load at that location, which would be WX squared over two, X being the distance of the CG of the UDL from the point of interest. So that would be W by two. And if the UDL is sitting right in the middle of this space from here to here, this distance would be simply this distance divided by two. So that would be L over two minus A by two square and if you were to do the math what you'd get is w by 8 l square minus a square now this for a span of l equal to 70 meters and we know that for a cl625 truck we calculated that previously in the tutorial on the truck loading that a is equal to 2.2 meters what you'll find is that m udl works out to this number. So the M, the moment due to live load lane, in this case would be 80% of the truck. So 0.8 times the truck moment that we determined in the previous tutorial, plus M UDL, which is right here. And this gives me a value of 12,922 kilonewton meters. For a 70 meter span, that's subjected to CL625 lane loading. And you should be able to do these calculations for any span and your specific lane loading scenario. Here is a simplified approach to obtain the transverse load distribution factors for girder bridges that can be used during conceptual design in lieu of the more complex methodologies that are provided generally in codes such as the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code and AASHTO. After you've completed your longitudinal line girder analysis and have derived demands on a per lane or a per truck basis, these need to be then distributed to a per girder basis. I'd like to draw your attention to this situation where we've got girder spaced at a spacing of capital S. And on top of that, we've positioned a truck to maximize the load effect on this particular girder. And this truck sits in the middle of a lane and has a wheel spacing of A and a distance from the center line of the wheel to the edge of the lane of B. So for a Canadian CL625 truck, A would be equal to 1.8 meters. That would be the wheel spacing and B would be equal to 0.6 meters. The load at each wheel line is W. So W would be equal to half of 625 kilonewtons. So to maximize the load effect in this particular girder that sees the reaction R, we've positioned this truck so that one of the wheel lines is sitting directly on top of it. So just to calculate that reaction, what we would assume in this method is that the slab is simply supported between girder lines. So if we did that, R would be equal to from the left wheel line, all the load goes into it. And from the second wheel line, it would be equal to the load times a fraction S minus A divided by S, which would be equal to 2W by S, S minus A over 2. The transverse load distribution factor FT 
would be the ratio of the reaction in the girder divided by the total truck load, 2W, plugging in the value of R, what you'd get is 1 minus 0 0.9 divided by S, where S is in meters. This is, of course, for one lane being loaded. Now, as designers, we need to maximize the load effect on our components, and this bridge can certainly accommodate more than one lane. And so what we then need to do is look at various scenarios with two or more lanes loaded in order to maximize the load effect at this particular girder. And once we have that, then we can take the ratio to the load of one truck and see what fraction goes into it. And that would give us the transverse distribution factor. So we've done that for various scenarios. It really boils down to two cases. The first case where the spacing between the girders is between two and three meters. And the second case where the spacing is between three and four meters. And you'll notice there's two lanes loaded. We've looked at uh, a three lane scenario as well. However, these two cases with uh, two lanes loaded control the demands. So working our way to find the reaction under this particular girder, let's call it R, and the load of each wheel line is W. So R would be equal to W. That's the load from the wheel that's sitting directly on top of it. Then let's look at the wheel line to the left. So that would give a reaction of W times S minus A divided by S. And the first wheel line on the right would be W S minus 2B divided by S. Now, what you'll notice is that because of the girder spacing and the geometry of our lanes and truck, the second wheel line on the right is past the second support. So because of that, it is actually going to make my slab deflect like this, and it would actually impart a small tension force, T. Just calculating that tension force, what we can do is we can take moments about this girder line right here, and so that would give us a value of the tension force equal to W3 minus S divided by S. And if we were to simplify things, what we would get is R is equal to W by S, 4S minus 6. And then again, calculating FT, 2 minus 3 by S. Similarly, for this other situation where we've got a wider girder spacing, and you'll notice that now we can nicely accommodate the four wheel lines that will all give a positive contribution to the reaction at our girder of interest. So that reaction R would be equal to W. Then the girder line on the left is going to give W S minus A over S. The first wheel line on the right is S minus 2B divided by S. And then the last wheel line, the second one on the right, would give W S minus 3 divided by S. This, uh, if we simplify, ends up giving us W by S. 4s minus 6, which is actually the same as what we derived in the previous case, interestingly. And that would give me the same Ft of 2 minus 3 by s. So this would give us the controlling formula for Ft. That is going to form our recommendation. So our recommendation is, at conceptual design, you could use this very simple formula of 2 minus 3 divided by s times a modification factor m. You can think of this as a multi-lane modification factor, and we've used a factor of 0.8. And by using this and applying the formula, we've tabulated below the values that we get for various spans ranging between 2 to 4 meters. And what you find is that the use of these uh, transverse distribution factors during conceptual design is an easy and quick way of obtaining numbers that are close enough to reality without being overly conservative. And certainly they tend to be quite appropriate to use when compared to the values that you would obtain from the use of the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code.